join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this worship team. We thank you for this time of worship, and we just want to linger in your presence, God. How good it is just to be in your presence. And we're not here for fancy songs or fancy words. We're here for your presence. So thank you for blessing us with you. We cling to you. May you be glorified. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ and all God's children say, amen. Uh, good morning. I am Chris Pan. Uh, welcome again to First Prez. I'm the executive director of the church here. And uh, it's an easy transition from that great worship because today I want to start by uh, telling some mother-in-law jokes. Uh, so what do you get when you cross a mother-in-law with, I'm just kidding, uh, I am not going to tell mother-in-law jokes. Um, I love my mother-in-law. She is wonderful and delightful. I know that some of you are um, mother-in-laws, and you are all wonderful and delightful people. My mother-in-law is actually here, so you are wonderful mother-in-law. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you can all relax. I'm not going to tell mother-in-law jokes, but I am going to tell you a mother-in-law story uh, because this story is actually from the Bible. Uh, there's this entire book in the Bible about the incredibly tender and faithful love between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. Uh, and the mother-in-law is named Naomi, and the daughter-in-law is named Ruth. Uh, the book of Ruth is in the Old Testament of the Bible, and the events take place about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And back then, before Israel had kings like David and Solomon, they were ruled uh, in a period of judges. Um, and the book of Ruth happens during this period of judges, which is why you'll find the book of Ruth in your Bible immediately after the book of Judges. Uh, as we go through our sermon today, ask yourself, uh, two questions. Ask yourself these two questions. What is God saying to me, and what does he want me to do about it? What is God saying to me, what does he want me to do about it? Will you join me again in prayer? God, you are love. And so we invite your Holy Spirit now to open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts. God, we don't want to just be informed today. We want to be transformed. We don't want to be informed. We want to be inspired by your Holy Spirit. May it be so. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus, and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Our story starts in Israel, in a little town called Bethlehem. Uh, and there was a woman there named Naomi. And she's married, and she has two adult sons. And a famine hits the land of Israel. So Naomi and her family move to Moab. I'm going to make that cameraman work today. Uh, she moves to Moab. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so she's in Moab with her husband and her two kids, uh, her two adult sons. And immediately tragedy hits. Uh, her husband dies. Um, and so she's there with her two sons in this foreign land. And her two adult sons get married uh, to Moabite women, foreign women. Uh, one of them is named Orpah and one of them is named Ruth. And they live there um, in Moab for another 10 years. But then tragedy strikes again. Uh, both of the sons die. Uh, both sons die, and so now Ruth is left uh, with her two daughter-in-law. She's lost her husband and both her two sons. And this happens in the very first chapter in the book of Ruth. Uh, can I say that I know that many of you have experienced great tragedy in your lives, and that some of you are going through great tragedy or a hard time in your life even right now? Um, and so please know, as we go through this passage, we'll see that God is in it step by step with Naomi, he's in it step by step with you too today. God sees Naomi through and he'll see you through also. After all this tragedy, Naomi hears that the famine in Israel is over. Um, so she decides to move back to Israel. Uh, and it doesn't take Naomi long to pack up her things, less than a day. So we know that she is not uh, rich. Um, in fact, that's just the opposite. And so Naomi and her two daughters-in-law start the move back to Israel. But early on on the trip, Naomi stops and tells her daughters-in-law, you know what? Don't come back with me. It doesn't make any sense. There's nothing for you in Israel. You should stay here in Moab. Go back to your families. Um, you two have been kind to me. May God be kind to you. Stay here in Moab and continue your life. And they're all crying, and both daughters-in-law say, no, we're going to go with you to Israel. And Naomi is crying. She says, don't be silly. You should stay here. There's nothing for you in Israel. Stay in Moab. And they all cry some more. 
And Orpah, one of the daughters-in-law, decides to listen to her mother-in-law, take her advice, and stays in Moab. But the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, no, I'm going to go with you, Naomi. Ruth chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to Naomi. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a print by the poet William Blake from 1795 capturing this scene. Orpah leaving and Ruth clinging to Naomi. Ruth saying to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Not even death itself is going to come between us. Let's meditate today about love and friendship and community. Ruth and Naomi are such tremendous examples of this selfless love. As we think about what our lives are going to look like post-pandemic, one of the things we need to learn to lean back into is each other. We need to learn back, lean back into relationships and people, how to be in relationships with real, live people. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think we all got kind of weird over 20 months of uh, lockdowns and uh, isolation and Zoom meetings. Um, uh, you know, even before COVID, I was always really awkward um, when I met people. Like, uh, I didn't know what to do with my hands, uh, particularly here in Hawaii. I don't know if I like shake their hands or give them a hug or give them one of these like bro hugs. Um, and that's before uh, COVID, like after COVID. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to fist bump people or handshake them. And so I end up just kind of standing awkwardly now and just kind of waving from a distance because uh, I don't know what to do. Um, interacting with real live people is hard. Uh, but the story of Ruth and Naomi shows us that we need people and that people need us. Maybe you're one of these people who think, I don't need people. All I need is Jesus. Well, you're wrong. You need people. Uh, and you need relationships. God created us in his image. And the image of God, God himself, is in relationship, in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons in relationship. In the Garden of Eden, uh, God creates everything. And then he declares over everything, it is good. And then he sees something that is not good. And you know what it is? It's mosquitoes. God says, mosquitoes, man, those are not good. Uh, I'm just kidding. God creates everything, including mosquitoes, and he says, it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then he sees something, and for the first time says, it's not good. Genesis chapter 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Remember, this takes place before the fall before the serpent and the forbidden fruit, before sin enters the world, in God's perfect creation, God looks out and says, that's not good. That guy needs a buddy. Worse than mosquitoes is Adam being alone. Worse than cockroaches or centipedes or man of war, it's that we need a buddy. We don't, we shouldn't be alone. Jeff Page preached last week about God's invitation to us to dream again. Uh, and as we emerge from the pandemic, we're invited to dream again about God's goodness in our lives. What does that look like in our lives and in our world? And as I, think, I think as we emerge from the pandemic, God is also inviting us to dream again about leaning back into community, about relationships, about clinging to one another again. And you might be thinking, great, uh, I would love to have a friend now assigned to me. Uh, someone who will cling to me and love me well. Uh, it worked out great for Naomi and for Adam. Uh, God, bring me this magical uh, helper and friend and companion who will love me so unconditionally. Where in the chat window can I click on the button to have the church assign me a, button, uh, a buddy to support me like uh, Ruth and Eve? And I think that's what's interesting about this story about Naomi and Ruth. Um, I think we all wish we were Naomi or Adam uh, and that we had someone like Ruth or Eve to love us 
unconditionally, to love us and support us so well, someone to cling with us. But our challenge isn't to be Naomi or Adam and wait for someone to come along and love us well. Our challenge, our call, our invitation is to love like Ruth, to leave our place of comfort, to take a risk, to love someone else selflessly and profoundly, to go and be a great friend to them. Our meet and greet question today was, who is God putting on your heart that you might call or visit this week? Maybe it's an old friend or a family member or an old colleague from work. Um, if you're looking for community, there's a lot of things getting going again here on the campus and here at church. There's Gen X ministry and young adult ministry and vintage and alpha and rooted. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can get invested in other people and make a community of support. And I should mention that if you're in crisis or in need and support, the church has a group of Stephen ministers um, who can walk with you through crisis one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and our Stephen's ministers have gotten over 50 hours of training um, so they can go and love like Ruth. Check out our website if you want more information on those things. Uh, but back to Ruth. Um, I had a friend in college who loved the name Ruth. Uh, and no offense to all the many wonderful Ruths in our congregation. I thought that was kind of odd because Ruth to me seems like an old-timey name. Uh, but my friend said they loved the name Ruth because of the word ruthless. Um, ruthless means having no compassion, no mercy, no pity for others, being harsh and cruel, unfeeling, doing anything you want to achieve what you want. Uh, that's ruthless. So what's Ruth? Ruth must be the opposite of that. Uh, but we don't use that word. Uh, you know, if we say, hey, man, that guy is ruthless, we know exactly what that means. But the opposite of that, what is the opposite of that? Man, that guy is Ruth, or that guy is full of Ruth, or that guy is ruthful. Uh, and I thought this was, like, funny. Uh, I was like, man, just, ha-ha, like, ruthful, that's, like, a funny word. Uh, it sounds funny, but I was writing, I was like, you know, I should probably look this up. Uh, and I look it up, and lo and behold, ruthful is a real word. Uh, yeah, who knew? Learn something new every day. Uh, ruthful, adjective, definition, to be full of Ruth, tender, merciful, compassionate. You know, the, the name Ruth in Hebrew it actually translates to friend, companion, a buddy. Uh, and I know we're saying this every week, or it seems like we're saying it every week. We're living in an increasingly divisive world um, and a culture that is angry and oftentimes ruthless. But I think God is inviting us to be ruthful, compassion and tender and merciful, to be a friend and companion full of Ruth. Of course, this is very easy because people are very easy to love. Uh, they are not at all prickly or grouchy or problematic. No one is ever trying to you know, cut you off in their lifted pickup truck going 80 miles per hour down the highway. There's nobody at work who's taking credit for your ideas. There's nobody at school who's not pulling their weight in the, in the, in the joint projects. Um, you know what the name Naomi means in Hebrew? It means Pleasant. Naomi means pleasant. Naomi must be easy for Ruth to love. When Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem in chapter 1, uh, the whole town is excited that Naomi's back. After more than a decade away, they say, hey, Naomi's back. Uh, and Naomi says this in Ruth 1.20. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi means pleasant, and Mara means bitter. And Naomi is not easy to love. Just like we are not easy to love. Just like other people are not easy to love. Sometimes they are not pleasant. Sometimes they are bitter. They are giant, unhappy grouches. But can we still be ruthful and tender and compassionate and merciful? Can we still, even then, be a good friend and companion? I want to read the message translation of this scene when uh, Naomi shows back up in Bethlehem because I find it just delightful. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was soon buzzing. Is this really our Naomi? And after all this time. But she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. The strong one has dealt me a bitter blow. I left here full of life, and God has brought me back with nothing but the clothes on my back. Why would you call me Naomi? God certainly doesn't. The strong one ruined me. And so Naomi was back. And Ruth, the foreigner with her, back from the country of Moab. 
I love that line, and so Naomi was back. Uh, I just think it's so great. Is there anybody in your life who's like, oh man, that guy's back now? Um, <laughs> can I point something else here that shows up um, in this description of Ruth? Uh, Ruth the foreigner. It says this all throughout the book. Ruth the foreigner, Ruth the Moabite. Ruth is constantly being referred to in this way. And people meet her and say, oh, you're Ruth the foreigner, you're Ruth the Moabite. Uh, can I remind you that the Bible is full of everyday people like you and me, everyday, unexceptional, normal people like you and me. Yes, there are a few queens and kings, but mostly it's just a lot of shepherds and fishermen and tax collectors and foreigners and bitter mother-in-laws, people like me and you. But God used them. He worked in their lives and through their lives. So wherever you are in your life today, whatever you're going through, whatever you think about yourself, know this, God is not done with you. God has a plan for you. God is going to work through you. God is going to love the world through you. The vast majority of the book of Ruth is dialogue. Highest proportion of dialogue in any book in the Bible. There are only 85 verses in this relatively short book, and 55 of them are dialogue. It's two-thirds of the book is just Ruth and Naomi talking, or later on, Ruth and Boaz talking. Um, I encourage you to read the book of Ruth sometime this week. It is a short book. It's wonderful. Um, it's uh, a beautiful story. And the best part is that it, is, it has no villains. Uh, there are no bad guys in the book of Ruth. Everyone is trying to just do their best. Uh, even Orpah, the daughter-in-law who stays in Moab, she's just listening to Ruth. She's just obeying her mother-in-law. Uh, everyone's a good guy trying to do the they do their best, and I, I think of it like uh, it's the Ted Lasso of the Old Testament, if you're familiar with that show. Uh, but anyway, we're talking about dialogue, and so Naomi, as she has established, is bitter. Um, and, you know, it's great that she's honest and she's expressing what we all know, that we can express ourselves to God in this way. But in her bitterness, in her anger, she is theologically wrong. Uh, in her obvious grief and justified anger, she's blaming God for her problems. Naomi says, God has made my life bitter. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. God is doing these terrible things to me. Uh, there are terrible things that happen in the world. Evil and suffering is real. And there are no easy answers. But God is good. God is good. And we always have to start there, that God is good. And there is evil and suffering and tragedy in the world. And I don't understand it, but God is good. That's a sermon for another time. Um, a few weeks ago, Pastor Dan preached about Job and his suffering. And as he was going through his suffering, his friends gave him advice and talked at him for 21 chapters. Um, and does Ruth respond like that to Naomi's anguish and anger and pain? She does not. Um, in this book that has more dialogue than any other book in the Bible, uh, there is nothing recorded of what Ruth says in this situation. Um, this whole journey from Moab back to Bethlehem uh, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about what Ruth says. Uh, for all we know, Ruth doesn't say anything or nothing uh, that needed to be recorded. And I have a hard time with this because I used to be a lawyer and I like to talk. <laughs> and now I'm a preacher. And so it's same, same. Uh, but Pastor Steve has said many times, if you want to be a good friend, start with listening. Steve has shared this quote before. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Uh, when I was going through a uh, very rough um, stretch of depression last year. I saved a little webcomic to my phone uh, because I wanted people to help. Uh, I knew that people wanted to help. People wanted to help me, but they didn't know how. And so I'd show them this uh, comic. And if you're listening to the podcast later, or if you're in the back and you can't see the, the captions here, it's just a four-panel comic. And the first one, this little pink blob guy is saying to this blue blob, blob guy, hey, are you okay? And the blue blob guy says, not really. And then the pink guy says, you want to talk about it? And the blue guy says, not really. And the third panel, Pink guy just looks at the blue guy, and then final panel, pink guy just sits down. Nothing said, but they're both just smiling in that last panel. If you want to learn how to be a good friend, ruthful, compassionate, tender, merciful, start here. Remember this comic. Just listen and be present. That's how Ruth loves Naomi and how we are called to love others. Just be present. Can we think of someone to be present with this week? Can we look for opportunities this week that God is giving us to be present in the lives of those people around us? To be like Ruth and love someone well. How else does Ruth love Naomi? There's this incredible moment in chapter 2. 
uh, and it's a tiny moment, you uh, blink and you'll miss it. Uh, Naomi and Ruth have resettled in Bethlehem. And again, they are not wealthy women. Uh, they are living in poverty or on the edge of poverty. Uh, and so to survive, Ruth collects the leftovers from the harvest. And she's noticed by the owner of the field, a man named Boaz. And uh, Ruth is offered protection, and she's offered lunch that day. Uh, and so Ruth eats lunch, and then she continues working in the field all throughout the day until evening. And then, to, then she goes home to uh, Naomi. Chapter 2, 18. Ruth gathered up her gleanings, went back to town, and showed her mother-in-law the results of her day's work. Ruth also gave Naomi the leftovers from her lunch. And then the narrative continues, continues going on. But that little phrase, Ruth also gave Naomi the leftovers from her lunch, it really stuck with me. Um, Ruth worked all morning, working in the fields, gleaning. Um, and then she was offered a simple lunch of bread dipped in wine. And then Ruth continued to work all afternoon into the evening. But that whole time, uh, Ruth thought of Naomi. And she kept this leftover bread from lunch with her. She kept it from being eaten by birds or bugs. And when she got home, she gave that leftover bread to Naomi. Uh, I love this. Uh, and so how to be a good friend. First, be present. Uh, be a good listener. Second, give them your leftovers. Nobody laughed at the first service either. Uh, and so, um, yes, give them your leftovers, but it's a indicative of a larger um, theme, which is, can we be other-centered instead of self-centered? In a culture that is obsessed with uh, protecting what's mine and taking what's mine and getting what's mine, can we be people who focus on giving to others? God's grace is shown through Ruth's love and compassion. And that grace and that love brings about a change in Naomi. As Naomi hears about Ruth's day and the kindness of the man in the field, Naomi sees God's hand at work. She goes from blaming God for all her sorrows to saying this in verse 20 of chapter 2. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Why, God bless that man. God hasn't quite walked out on us after all. He still loves us in bad times as well as good. That is theologically true. God still loves us in bad times as well as good. God is good. And Naomi didn't get to that point because somebody argued with her to there. Uh, she got to that point because she was loved there, that she was loved well, and she got to this theologically true point. And so we are called to love well. Uh, but I want to be honest and realistic. Um, we can try to love people well on our own, and we're going to fail because we are human and faulty and broken people. And every Sunday, we're not up here giving you a TED Talk about three tips on how to make friends or how to have you know, a, a more improved life. Uh, we're pointing you here every Sunday to the only solution to our human problem, the only solution to our broken relationships. And that solution is not to work harder or try harder or be better. Hear now the good news of the gospel. A thousand years after Ruth, someone else came along who loved like Ruth loved ruthfully, tenderly, with compassion and mercy. And lo and behold, it was Ruth's great, 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 many generations grandson named Jesus. Ruth marries that man in the field, Boaz, and they have a son. And that son becomes the grandfather of King David. And many generations later, the descendant of David and the descendant, the direct descendant of Ruth, is Jesus Christ, who was born in a little town called Bethlehem. Ruth, the foreigner, the Moabite, this bitter woman, this widow from a strange land, uh, or this widow who, who loves well, loves Naomi, this bitter woman from a strange land. She's at one point living in poverty. She becomes Jesus' great, great, great generation's grandmother. And the good news of the gospel isn't that Ruth loves Naomi. Uh, the good news of the gospel isn't that we should love other people like Ruth loves Naomi. The good news of the gospel isn't that we should love God like Ruth loves Naomi. The good news of the gospel is that God loves us like Ruth loves Naomi. That Jesus loves us like Ruth loves Naomi in this profound and compassionate way. It's not just that we cling to Jesus. It's that Jesus clings to us. I said earlier that we, I think we all wish that we were Naomi or Adam and we just kind of wish that God would give us this, you know, friend who would love us unconditionally, support us unconditionally, someone who would cling to us, that we wanted to that God would give us someone who would love us like that. 
And the gospel is, the good news of the gospel is, is that we do have someone like that. In our bitterness, in our grouchiness, in our anguish or anger, Jesus loves us. Jesus clings to us. Jesus loves us first. 1 John chapter 4, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God pursues us. That's the good news of the gospel again and again. You can love Confucius or Buddha or L. Ron Hubbard, but they're not going to love you back. Uh, Our God, he not only loves us back, but he loves us first. God says in Isaiah, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I. Here am I. In the book of Ezekiel, it says, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, Jesus describes a shepherd who seeks out the one lost sheep in his flock of 100 uh, and rejoices when that one sheep is found. Jesus describes a woman who's looking, after, looking out for this one lost coin and rejoices when that coin is found. And Jesus describes a father who runs to meet his long-lost son and rejoices when that long-lost son comes home. And Jesus says, so it is with us, that God pursues us, God searches for us, that God loves us. And only because God loves us and loves us first are we able to then love the people around us in our world. We can love like Ruth because we have been loved by God. First John continues, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And their (laughs) mother-in-law. On the night Jesus was betrayed, the night before he goes to die on the cross, Jesus tells his closest friends at the Last Supper exactly how the world will know that we are followers of his. Uh, And what marks us as followers of Jesus are not um, Christian t-shirts or cross necklaces. Uh, It's not the music we listen to or it's not the things we oppose or abstain from. Uh, It's not the way we vote um, and it's not even the way we spend our Sunday mornings. Uh, It's our love. It's how we love each other. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What marks us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, is if we have love for one another. God has loved us well. And he loved us first. And so we love God and we love each other. And by loving each other, the world will know um, that we are followers of Jesus. By loving even the hard-to-love ones, the bitter ones, by loving maybe especially the hard-to-love ones and the bitter ones, the world will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Can we hear again what Ruth says to Naomi? But rather than just what Ruth says to Naomi, can you hear these words? Because Jesus says these words to you. He says these words to us. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Not even death itself is going to come between us. Jesus loves us and says this to us today and every day. Can we cling to Jesus, cling to his love and say this to the other people in our lives this week? Who is God putting on your heart now? Can we take a few moments now just to close our eyes and to pray? to ask God this question. God, who are you putting on my heart now? God, what are you saying to us? What do you want us to do about it? God, open our ears, open our eyes to hear you now. Open our eyes to the opportunities to love well this week. Who can we love well with your love? God, we thank you that you loved us first, that you pursued us, 
that you seek us. God, we thank you that your presence is here with us. We know that there might be someone here who has never seen you clearly, who has never seen your love clearly, but wants to commit, wants to know and love you and cling to you like you cling to us. And so if someone's here today, in person or online, and they want to make that commitment, I just want to pray a simple prayer that says, sorry, God, for the things I've done that have led me astray from you. Thank you for making a way for me to be reconciled to you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And please, be my God now and forever. And if someone's prayed that prayer, we pray that you find me after the service here in person or to click that button in the chat. But God, we pray that you be glorified. You be glorified in our lives. You be glorified through our love to others. And we pray that you fill us again and again with your love. We need nothing but your love. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ and all God's children say, amen. 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 Thank you so much for that very, very powerful worship all day today. Um, Last week I was at the coffee bar after service and somebody was saying how wonderful it was just to sit and have coffee and to, uh, you know, just reconnect with people. And so we invite you, if you're here in the sanctuary, to go to the coffee bar. We invite you, if you're in the sanctuary, if you're online, to just lean back into the relationships in your life. We have been loved well, and may we go into the world now and love well. Uh, now receive this final blessing. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's children say, Amen.